so hopefully I won't hear your stomachs grumble too much uh, as we get towards the end. Um, the first uh, kind of disease that I want to talk about that's not really a disease, so to speak, is, is black layer. Um, and I want to talk about um, how related it is to anaerobic or a soil that does not have air. Um, so particularly when you have, when you're in your monsoon or your rainy season, you can get locked up, or if you have salts that are locking up your soil profile, or if you have drains that aren't working well in your greens, you can have a problem with black layer. Um, and black layer is the accumulation of anaerobic bacteria or bacteria that thrive in a condition where there's lacking of oxygen. And they will accumulate and produce sulfur gas that will basically um, act as a toxin to your roots. So this is normally very easy, and, and I think it's um, easy to diagnose. But you need to, when you're having a turf grass problem on the surface, it's important that you don't bring out a shovel, but it's important that you dig um, and know what's going on within your soil profile. Um, so this one, you can, uh, you'll can, you see it's, it should be very obvious. You'll have a black stripe. Um, sometimes it'll be a little bit, this is a, a very obvious uh, condition. Also look around, in particular, if you have decline, if you have a liner um, in your green, because that liner can hold the water. And if you have too much water in a green, you don't have enough oxygen in your pore space. And that's what's causing this black layer condition. Um, so with this, you can use your nose. Um, so when we it comes to diagnosing turf grass problems, we can use all of our senses. Uh, so I'll talk about using your nose also with fairy ring diagnosis. But this one in particular will smell like rotten eggs. Um, very diagnostic um, condition. So the causes of this can be plug drainage lines in particular, too much irrigation or rain, um, particularly if you're syringing too much or um, if you have somebody who's, who's prone to, I think I saw a slide yesterday where they're, they're holding the hose and, and looking at perhaps something else and distracted um, and they're, they're hitting it with one, one area over and over again. Uh, syringing with warm water can also happen uh, if you have water that is high in salts. So I think it's very important that you monitor not just your soil conditions, um, so what's going on with soil pH or nutrients within your soil, but also your irrigation water quality. You should know um, how much bicarbonates or how much dissolved salts you have in your irrigation water. Um, if you have greens and pockets, um, and what I mean by that, if there's trees that are all the way around or uh, wind isn't able to, to come in and move water off, then you can have too much water there and not enough oxygen, and then higher organic matter. And we talk about how to cure this. There's no really other cure than to try and cultivate it um, and to try and get air back in uh, to that root zone. Um, I think we often forget that roots need air just like we do. Um, so it's important that we get air in there that obviously will promote other bacteria that will replace these anaerobic bacteria that are causing the black layer. Um, now from the darkness below, how about the darkness that's on top? Um, so surface algae, or sometimes we call it cyanobacteria, um, the black areas that will be on top of the surface. Obviously, one reason for those that, for that that's, that's very easy is that you don't have density of the turf grass plant. Um, so the density is not there and the algae comes in to take over. But this is also a water-related issue as well. Um, so trying to dry out those areas and particularly dry off that, that surface part will help to try and maintain that out or uh, beat back that algae. Oops, that didn't work out very well. Um, but the animation, you might see it right there. Uh, but you also can have these algae that can cause some yellowing. Or, uh, in, in particular, this happens on our grasses. Um, it doesn't happen on Bermuda grass and seashore past Palum, and I see that often. Um, but also, you can see where it's actually intimately involved in the plant. 
Um, so the algae can actually infest and, and get uh, around the crown tissue, and that's when you have a, a very big problem because these algae can actually produce toxins. Um, so you want to try and maintain your algae. Um, much the same causes as black layer. Um, aerification probably won't help as much, uh, but something like a light verticut to try and break up those mats would be a little bit better uh, than perhaps a core, uh, 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 core aerification. Try to dry them out as much as possible. Um, solid tine aerification, sand top dressing on top um, so that you're actually building up and, and drying out that surface area. Um, and then also we can also use regular applications of fungicides like chlorothalonil, mancozeb, or the phosphites or the phosphoric acids. Um, and just recently in the last, uh, this is a golf course management, this is a U.S. publication um, from the U.S. Golf Course Superintendents Association. They just found that phosphites reduce cyanobacteria. So these are my colleagues, uh, John Inguijado from uh, Connecticut and John Kaminsky from Penn State uh, did this research and found reduction in surface algae from phosphor phosphite products. And for the most part, those are going to be, uh, they're normally a little bit cheaper um, than a normal fungicide would be. So this might be a good route um, to go for surface algae reduction. All right, so back to the disease triangle. I kind of talked about two that weren't really pathogens per se, um, but for the most part were are just kind of there, um, not really infecting the plant, but producing some toxin outside. Now we're gonna talk about the pathogens that are in. Um, these are the ones that are what we normally think of as causing diseases. Um, and the biggest class of these, we can have fungi or bacteria or phytoplasmas or viruses, but the biggest class is gonna be fungi. Um, and then I'm not gonna discuss nematodes too much, um, but if you wanna bring those up in the, the question and answer section, um, we can talk about those a little bit. And I'd, I'd like to hear a little a little bit about what your experiences were, are, or, or if you don't know you have experience with nematodes. Um, but nematodes are roundworms, um, that they're microscopic. Um, and this is an interesting tidbit. If you took everything off of the earth and you only left nematodes, you could still see the outline of earth from outer space. Um, so, and in particular, you could see if you left them as a layer, the outlines of the mountains and the trees. Um, so nematodes are everywhere, and some of these are plant parasites. So when we get into the question and answer and you want to talk about nematodes more, I'll tell you more about our experiences. Um, but I'm really going to concentrate on the fungi um, because this is the biggest, the biggest uh, group of them. We don't really worry about viruses or bacteria very much, at least not that we know of, um, but the biggest group is fungi. Um, they're many-celled, they're microscopic. We think of them, you know, if you want to see uh, fungi very quickly, take a piece of bread and take a wet paper towel and put it in a Ziploc bag and put it onto your windowsill. You'll see fungi very quickly. Normally it'll be black and fuzzy and all that kind of stuff. So when you think of that though, think about your grass. Think about your golf course putting green. You know, you need to try and remove the humidity and the, the water that obviously is there, and that's why you're, you're sealing it in that plastic bag. Um, they can be spread by spores, but they also can be spread by mechanical movement. And the, the bottom line is they're pretty much everywhere. Um, so it's, it's not like we can, we can try and keep them out um, of a certain, a certain area. Like I said before, when we were talking about thatch, when they're not causing disease, most of our pathogens that are impacting the turf grass are kind of just hanging out in this thatch layer um, and breaking down dead material. And in that respect, the fungi are actually doing, which is the, the job that there's, we like them to do, which is to break down lignin and to break down the, the plants that are already dead. The problem is, is when they, they come up top and start hitting our host plants. Um, some of them produce these survival structures or overwintering structures, which you probably wouldn't worry about, but these, these are some of the other things that we look for. Um, this is actually a snow mold, uh, so if you're up in Japan, you'd worry about this, and, and red thread. Um, but these are two diseases that you wouldn't be worried about here in Southeast Asia. 
Um, again, they need water to grow, so getting back into the environment, it's important that we're reducing the water. Um, they're highly dependent on temperature, uh, so if you do have seasonal fluctuations, normally you're going to see these um, that are, will be occurring during your, your spring and summertime. Like I said, they're everywhere. It's not like we're going to be able to just keep them out of an area, um, and they're also decomposers. Um, the first disease that I want to talk about is dollar spot, and I know here in Thailand you only worry about dollar spot on seashore past pallum, um, so I'll, I'll try and concentrate on that a little bit, but this also, most of this will, will kind of slide over when we get into bent grass and our cool season species. Um, it's the most ubiquitous disease, um, so we can have dollar spot on zoysia grass, Bermuda grass, seashore past pallum, almost every turf grass is, uh, species can contract dollar spot. Um, the leaves are bleached and white. Uh, there's, there's a little bit of difference between the symptoms um, between different species. Uh, so this is the symptom on Kentucky bluegrass up north, and I'll show you some of the symptoms, particularly when we get into zoysia grass. Um, again, the major key here is for dollar spot, if you're having outbreaks, is that they're severe on under-fertilized turf grasses. Um, so part of your control strategy when you see dollar spot outbreaks is you know that you're a little bit light on nitrogen, um, and nitrogen will, will help to uh, recovery from this disease. Um, looking at the symptoms and signs, this is um, what it looks like on both Bermuda grass and zoysia grass. Pyre cut, you can see it kind of, it has a spot type of symptom. Um, so on the outside uh, will be a dark margin, and on the inside will be this lighter bleach colored. Um, and then if this is one in particular that you can take this inside um, your office and, and put it into a Tupperware container um, and you'll put a, a paper towel, a moist paper towel and seal it and this, the mycelium will kind of pop out like, uh, will pop out very quickly. Um, and then this is what we look, look for under the microscope, these kind of V-shaped mycelium, very big mycelium. We're talking about control. Um, again, we're, we're looking, this is a foliar disease, so reducing that duration of leaf wetness is very important. Uh, remove the dew in the morning um, at, whenever you can. Try to increase drainage, airify to keep, get the water out. Um, in particular, fertilize and warm season turf grasses is, is very important. If we do need to get on a fungicide for this, they're best applied preventatively or at the first sign of disease. Um, I can pretty much say for any of these diseases, once you get them, um, you're already behind the eight ball. Um, so you're already kind of behind. Um, because what happens is, is the pathogens are this population. And they mo normally start out small. So the pathogen population is, is, is small when we don't see symptoms. And then it rises and rises and rises and then there's a certain threshold where that population starts impacting the plant. Um, so when you're at that level, you already have a high pathogen population or number of individuals. And whenever you have a large number of individuals, it's much more difficult to control them, even with fungicides. And I'm gonna go more and more into detail about fungicide use uh, as we get towards lunch. Um, there's a number of different fungicides that are labeled for control. Um, the systemic ones, for the most part, are going to offer you the longer periods of control. Um, so in particular, when you're putting your, um, when you're looking at how much money these are costing, think about it in duration of control and effectiveness in control. Um, so I don't know what all, the, what all the fungicides cost in Thailand, but you need to look at your duration of control form. Because um, in particular, some of the uh, when you look at things like mancozeb or chlorothalonil, they might only control for seven or ten days, whereas you might have another fungicide which might control it for 21 or 28 days. So think about that when you're, if you do need to go on a fungicide program. Um, last but not least, fungicide resistance is a concern, particularly for this. Um, so we have three different classes of, of fungicides um, that are, have evolved resistance um, to um, that where the dollar spot population has evolved resistance to these three different classes. And when I'm talking about classes, I'm not talking about one fungicide. 
I'm talking about five, seven fungicides that are all underneath this class. And again, I'll talk more about fungicides in a little bit. Whatever you can do, those with seashore, past palum, fairways, or tees, whatever you can do to try and reduce the dew on top of them. So uh, this is dragging, so you can get a piece of rope or hose and drag those off if you're not going to mow them in the morning. Um, and you can get uh, a good amount of reduction of dollar spot just by doing that. Um, rolling is another, obviously you're not going to roll um, your fairways for the most part, but uh, rolling greens also is a very good way of reducing dollar spot pressure. And then again, the low nitrogen. So I just wanted to point this out again, that dollar spot um, is an indicator of low nitrogen and tells us that story. All right. So we've kind of talked uh, about one foliar disease, but now let's get into the nitty gritty into the hard ones. This is where we normally get into uh, a lot of difficulty when we're talking about control. Um, if we're gonna use fungicides, a lot of times we need to be preventative. And we also need to think about there's an, probably an underlying problem in the soil that we need to fix as well. Um, so we're gonna start hitting below the belt um, and talk, start talking about soil-borne pathogens um, because this is what really can impact, um, uh, have, a, have a large impact on turf grass health. Um, so I've kind of given you a list of, and, and um, within yours, within the, the USB drive, you won't see these, but these are kind of the, the big ones that I would consider for, for warm seasons, but notice these that are on the soil-borne side. Um, farrying, which is very difficult to control, nematodes, which are difficult, pythium root rot, which is difficult, Bermuda grass decline, which is difficult, spring dead spot, if you do go through um, seasonal and transitional, that is very difficult to control. So when we get into soil borne diseases, we're, we're really um, getting into, into very difficult concepts of management and how to, how to try and control these. Um, so the first one of these, I spent four years of my life on fairy ring, um, and this was for my PhD research. And I love, I, I'm a pathologist, I'm the only one in the room that's supposed, allowed to have a favorite disease, and this is my favorite disease. Um, it is very complex, it's very difficult to manage, um, and I'll, I'll show you why. Um, so this is a, what we call a type one fairy ring, so where you actually have decline of the grass, um, and I'm pretty sure that if you had this on your greens, you're not very happy um, with this when you get into your, um, particularly in, it normally will be around your dry times, but also can be around your monsoon as well. One thing I wanna point out is you notice what's going on here. Um, we're not just talking about controlling the pathogen. So it's not as easy as just grabbing a fungicide and saying, I'm gonna knock the pathogen down. There also is soil characteristics that need to be fixed or remedied along with your uh, trying to control the pathogen at the same time. So that's what's going on here with the aerification. This is on ultra dwarf Bermuda grass. This is on Tiff Eagle. And what I wanna point out here is, this is last year's, the previous year's outbreak. So it's not just going away. And what that's, what that's caused by um, is a water repellency that the fairy ring fungus is imparting on that soil and they never were able to get the grass to grow back in. So obviously is a very severe symptom, um, but you can see here, this is the, the outer ring that's, that's the new growth from that fairy ring fungus. Um, so very difficult to control these. Uh, there's a variety of different symptom types. Um, yesterday I saw uh, big puff balls, which are called Calvatia gigantea. I'll have a picture of it at the end. They are edible, they're delicious. Don't eat every mushroom you see, please, because they can kill you. Um, but that is one that is, is fairly good and, and palatable, little butter, you fry it up like potato chips. Um, so the basidio carps normally aren't really impacting the grass very much. Um, but what you can evolve into is this rings of luxuriant growth, which means that um, basically what that fungus is doing is it's going through and it's degrading the organic matter um, within the soil. And in doing so, it, re it uh, releases plant-available nitrogen in the form of ammonia. Um, so that, that grass just takes up that nitrogen 
um, and sometimes it can be at very high rates. Uh, so they've measured 600 uh, to 800 parts per million of ammonia um, that can be released within those rings. Um, and actually that can be part of the reason why we see decline occur so quickly, because it actually can have some ammonia toxicity. Um, there's also, uh, and then last but not least is when you get into the uh-oh stage, um, or there's a problem and you start getting turf grass decline in these rings. They can be present at various depths of the profile. So on golf course putting greens, for the most part, you'll see them within the top inch. Um, but the ones that really get difficult to control, normally um, when we're looking at native soils, they can go down uh, four to six inches deep. So when you're thinking about controlling something that is four to six inches deep up, down in the soil profile, it becomes very, very difficult. I mean, darn, it's, it's difficult to control something that's in the top inch of the profile. Um, when we get into the the necrosis, it can be caused by a number of different ways. Um, so I talked about that ammonium toxicity here, but the biggest way is this hydrophobicity, and that's a fancy word for saying water repellency. So what I wanna point out here is that in this case, we got this cup cutter plug, um, and we had this under in a Tupperware. Um, so in our Tupperware thing, and um, we put the moist paper towel on the bottom and we sealed it up. This here is that water, that eyedropper. So we did it onto the soil profile here. This one we just put down um, just recently before we took the picture. This one here in the yellow has been sitting there three days. If you're not getting water into your soil profile for three days, you're gonna have dead grass. Um, so that's what's going on here. And you can see this orange discoloration, which can be a, an indicator. Um, also, I told you that you can use your nose, um, so you can actually smell it. Um, it'll smell like a musty old tent um, if, you, if you do any backpacking. Um, so that, that's some ways. Part of the reason why this is all, another reason why this is so difficult to control is that there's 60 different fungi that can produce these, and actually there's probably more than that. Um, so when we have a number of different fungi that can cause things, um, that means that they're different, they're different genetically. Um, so a lot of times it's very difficult to pick one fungicide or to pick, because um, you can have variation between one site and another site. So some conditions that favor fairing, sandy soils, unfortunately, are putting greens, particularly new putting greens. Um, for some reason, uh, when you build a putting green, it's, it's like the... Uh, like a baseball field or a sports field, um, build it and they will come. For some reason, fairy rings like to be the first thing that invade and you normally will get them from the outside coming in. Um, and it, it basically is just a, an easy way for them to get in. Excessive thatch accumulation, obviously that's their food. Um, that's what's getting them going. Soil mo moisture extremes, um, a lot of times in particular that water repellency will set up very quickly if you go very high moisture to low and to high and to low. Um, a lot of times that, that hydrophobicity or that water repellency uh, will occur very quickly. And then lastly, nutrient deficiencies. You normally will see those green rings um, a little bit more prominently if you're low in nitrogen um, or iron. So if you do have an outbreak, if you do get these fairy rings, and in particular if they're, um, if they're killing the grass, you need to go after the soil conditions. So you need to go after the water repellency. And the first thing you should be bringing out is your aerifier. Um, you need to punch holes and be able to get water down in through what is basically um, a layer of concrete that's around in that ring. Um, the fungus is, but when it gets to this level, it's, it's very difficult to control. Um, again, I said the fungus is below the soil and at different depths. And really, we're not looking at a fungal infection of the plant. So there's not really, there's not a different species. We see fairy ring on, on every different turf, all different turf grass species. So it's not like you can pick a different plant and get around it. Um, and then lastly, the water repellency. So if your water's going this way and you're trying to apply a fungicide, then your fungicide's going this way. And the problem is here. Um, so that makes it very difficult when fairy ring starts, um, starts up in an area. 
Uh, some, if you look at the older textbooks, say to rec recommend to dig it up and start over, that's not going to be very, uh, I don't think your, your owners or your, your golfers are going to like that very much. Um, so luckily we do have some, some other things. And then others have recommended to strip the sod and start mixing the soil. Um, there is some antagonism that can go on um, between one fungus and another fungus. Uh, but we have tried that and it does not work. So when we're in an, a problem where we have fairy ring occurring um, and it's causing symptoms, it's very important that we're not just treating with a fungicide, but that we also are including a wetting agent along with that. Again, we need to get the fungicide in and get the fungicide down into the soil to control that fungus. So this is some work that was done by Bruce Martin, Dr. Bruce Martin from Clemson University. And what I wanna point out here is that this is the fungicide alone. And I'm sorry, the units are wrong. That's terrible on my part. Uh, but this is the fungicide alone. And this is fungicide with a wetting agent um, or a surfactant, or I like to call them fancy soaps. Because uh, basically what that's doing is allowing the fungicide to be carried down into the soil profile um, and you need that to break uh, through that water repellent layer. And you can see that again, doesn't matter if it's with heritage, which is azoxystrobin, pyraclostrobin here, or flutolanil, you can see that effective control is only um, curatively if you have the disease um, when you add the water uh, or the uh, surfactant along with it or the wetting agent. We did some work, and this is part of, of my PhD work. We looked at this preventatively. And again, this is gonna be a common theme when it comes to, to most disease control. It's good to, to know the history of your site. So if you know that ferrying is gonna occur in, in May, you don't wanna wait until you already have symptoms because then you're behind this, now I've got a get to the soil conditions, I've got to remedy those. I've got to worry about water repellency already going on. Um, so this is a preventative management strategy. We looked at 18 degrees soil temperature, measured at two inches over five days. Um, and again, we don't, you're never gonna be down to 18 degrees C here, I realize that. Um, but basically, what we have here is we're stopping that disease before it gets started. Um, so these applications are actually made back in, in April, um, and we're seeing the disease controlled out into June, July, and August, and actually longer control than if you went out, and less fungicide than if you went out on a curative basis. So this is uh, basically what's going on here. This is triademophon, which is DMI fungicide, and tebuconazole, another DMI fungicide, applied at these soil temperatures. And look at the decrease that we get. This is from a single application made at these soil temperatures. And you can see this is the untreated, um, you, so you can see how much fairing we had. And then you compare that um, to, to what we've done uh, in the first two years. And what's interesting is how much we're actually getting the untreated control as well. Uh, the fairing is not stagnant, and the, the theory is, is that it went into areas that we were treating um, from the at least from two or three years. So you can see that there's no difference here in the rate. So the good news is, is you can use the lower rate. The bad news is, is it wasn't total control. Um, so we're gonna use two applications instead of one application of the lower rate. So you're actually applying the higher rate, but you're splitting it into two so that you get a longer duration of control. Um, here, you know, for us at least, or, or where you do have uh, the seasons, 55 to 60, or 30, <laughs> sorry, uh, 16 to 18 degrees is, is around, 13 to 16 degrees Celsius is the soil temperature uh, that we targeted. The other aspect is we put a wetting agent along in with this preventative. Now remember, the hydrophobic, the water repellency hasn't set up yet. So that fairy ring hasn't gotten a chance to establish itself and set up this, this hydrophobic or this water repellent layer. Um, so really putting the wetting agent in didn't do anything. So if you do this, perhaps you don't need to 
put a wetting agent in along with it. Now, curatively, if you already have the symptoms, you have to put the wetting agent in with it. But if you go preventatively, you don't. Um, and one thing I want to point out is this is triademophon, and you notice here that I kind of crossed out triticonazole. Particularly for you that are with ultra-dwarf Bermuda grass greens, triticonazole can be hot, um, a little bit more phytotoxic than we see with triademophon or with um, some of the other DMI fungicides. So I would not recommend triticonazole uh, within this application strategy. Um, so when we look at this, this is a lot of words. I'm not going to read all this to you. Uh, you'll have it on your USB drive. Um, but for the most part, we're looking at low rates of, of these DMIs. So triademophon and tebuconazole are two that work very well in this application strategy. And you're going to apply these now you're going to know when the fairing is occurring. So I'm going to guess that your fairing is normally occurring when we get into May, April into May, or when you get into the rainy season, perhaps. Um, so you want to be putting it out before then. Now we do have some experience in Hawaii on Tiff Eagle, and they applied these fungicides in December and January and got very good control. And that lasted for about three months um, and then they might have had to do one after that. But you're looking at a, a decent amount of control. Now for here, I'm not sure exactly when those applications would be made, but I would try to do it about, based on your history, two to three months before you see activity um, to tru truly make it preventatively. Um, make sure that you're using some care that the DMI fungicides are plant growth regulators. So Dr. Kreiser talked about plant growth regulators and realized that DMI fungicides are plant growth regulators too. Um, the difference is, is that the ones that are plant growth regulators are really good plant growth regulators and bad fungicides, and these DMI fungicides are really good fungicides but really bad plant growth regulators. Um, we're going to be making two applications at the low rate, 28 days apart. Um, and that's, that's what we've seen has given us the longest amount of control for the least amount of fungicide. I've often been, been accused of killing two birds with one stone and trying to squeeze the turn blood out of a turnip. Um, so what I want to point out here is that you are getting particularly those that have seashore past pallum. You are getting some dollar spot control out of this as well. Um, so if you have seashore past pallum greens in particular, um, I want to point out that, again, I didn't change those, but these are the DMI applications. The last application was made in mid-May, and you can see the amount of dollar spot control we get uh, compared to the untreated control and just a PGR application. So you are going to get a little bit bang for your buck um, as far as dollar spot control, too. And when we look at that, again, this is for those that have seasons, uh, but you're looking at fairing and dollar spot that are normally within, this is normally going to be 55 or 13 to 18 degrees C. Um, and the next question becomes, well, what about Bermuda grass decline? Um, so when we look at Bermuda grass decline, we, we know that it's a very similar um, pathogen to take all patch. Um, and when we look at take all patch, this is normally still within that window where we might be getting some activity on Bermuda grass decline too. So now I'm trying to hit three birds with one stone. Um, but the idea is that these watered in applications that are targeting something in the soil uh, could be having more than one target, uh, which is what we really want to try and do when we're maximizing our fungicide program. So I do want to get into Bermuda grass decline. Um, being in Missouri, I don't have a lot of experience with this disease, um, so I have some, some work from other colleagues um, and, and some other, other experiences. But this is a very similar uh, pathogen to, to one take-all patch on bent grass. Um, periods of prolonged rainfall will encourage this disease or over-irrigation. So again, water and drainage is, is very important. When you get into your rainy season starting in May, um, and you get that, you know, six months of rain, this is normally when, in cloud cover, you're, you might see this, uh, symptoms of this disease pop up. Um, the fungus colonizes the root cortex and vascular system, uh, which you can see, you can see here. Um, this is how the disease normally kind of starts up. 
Um, so I do want to kind of warn you a little bit that we often will look at this and go, ah, this is just uh, my Bermuda grass segregating out, or it's just clones. Um, so you might want to dig up some plants and start looking at the roots a little bit and make sure that you're not having that darkening of the root system. Um, because again, you would, most of the time you would just walk over this and, and not look at it, but this can evolve into Bermuda grass decline very quickly and large stand loss. Um, so some tips um, that I, I've uh, gotten from Phil Harmon at University of Florida, uh, who's done the most extensive research on this disease, is to make sure that you're managing your fertilizer applications carefully during that rainy season. Uh, remember that you've got a limitation of those roots, particularly the ones that are infected. Um, high pH favors the disease. That's a, that's a very big clue to me that we're, we're looking at something that uh, if we could use ammonium-based fertilizers, if we have high pH soils, uh, perhaps we need to, to think about using ammonium-based or perhaps manganese applications, which we don't know about yet. Um, symptoms may be masked with, with micronutrients. Um, and then remember to spoon feed those disease plants and try to apply fungicides preventatively. And when we're thinking about that, that's going to be before our rainy season starts in May, uh, at least here in Thailand. Uh, don't forget about the soil nitrogen effect. Um, there is some, some implications here that Bermuda grass decline can be reduced, particularly in high pH soils uh, with ammonium-based or acidifying fertilizers. Um, and don't forget about manganese. So let's get into talking a little bit about fungicide use. Um, I know that uh, they're expensive. You don't want to use fungicides as much as possible. That's why I've kind of started talking about all the cultural practices and all the environmental modifications that we can do. But there are times that diseases are just going to happen. It's just, you're, and you, you're going to need to go into that fungicide toolbox. I think that it's important to realize what a fungicide is. Um, it's a, a chemical that inhibits um, fungal growth for the most part. So what that means is there's some implications. We're not killing the fungus. For the most part, we're just stopping it from growing long enough to where the plant can start to compete and recover. And that has some pretty big implications when we talk about fungicide use. Um, so we often talk, uh, we actually should be using the term fungistat, which means a a halting or a resting of growth instead of the term fungicide. Because the reason we, we don't want to use, I, I don't really like using fungicides for the most part, is that we think of herbicides that kill plants. We see that weed and that weed dies and it makes us feel good, it goes yellow. And then insecticides, if we're going to kill bill bugs or grubs, the grub dies and it makes us feel good. You know, if we're after a rodent, like Carl Spackler and uh, Caddyshack, one of my favorite movies. You know, you could blow up the, you know, he plants bombs and blows up. That makes us feel good. But the problem is with fungicides, we're not really taking things out for the most part. Um, so there's some implications when we talk about how we use fungicides. Um, and we've got to realize that fungicides are a temporary fix. We can go out with a herbicide and a pre-emergent and we can totally restrict all, all growth of that, the weed species that we're after because we're inhibiting the seedling growth. You know, when insecticides, we might have to apply a metacloprid or something to, for grubs that's going to last season long. With fungicides, we have very short application intervals. So with something like chlorothalonil or mancozeb, we might be looking at seven or 10 days um, some of the longer systemic fungicides might be 21 or 28 days. The implication there is that you're probably going to have to apply again. Um, and the other, the other part of that, again, is that you want to try and get after these, this preventatively, and that's the way that you're going to be able to extend your application interval. The other aspect is, is that coverage is extremely important. Um, you can miss a weed um, for the most part. You might be able to spray half of a weed because it's this big. The problem is, is we're talking about controlling microbes. So when you're doing nozzle selection or you're driving the sprayer with a fungicide, you need to be very careful that you're applying the fungicide uniformly across the surface. 
Um, otherwise, that little microbe or a little strip, um, you can miss that and you'll see diseases perfectly. That's when disease can happen in straight lines. Um, at least it'll be spotted within the straight line as if you have a skip. And then lastly, fungicide resistance. Um, we know that we have resistance in fungicides and insecticides and herbicides, um, and we need to be thinking about alternating chemistries if we can. So when we select fungicides, we, we have to do our research and know the fungicide active ingredient. It's very important that we don't just look at the fungicide on what is the big name on the label. We need to look down at what that active ingredient is and realize what the class is and the type. Um, we have to know the disease. So there are some fungicides that work great for our broad spectrum, but if we have an, something like Pythium root rot in our Bermuda grass greens, or if we have really wet greens and we need to try and control Pythium, that's a whole different class of fungicides that we have to use. Um, so it, it's important that we know that. Also, where is the pathogen? Are we dealing with a foliar disease? Are we dealing with a soilborne disease? Do I need to water it in? Do I need to leave it on the surface? What is our timing? Again, this revolves around the biology of that fungus that's, that's, doing, um, that's uh, producing the disease. Know your history, a site history is very, very important. The hardest job you have is that first year as being a superintendent because you don't know what's gonna happen and you don't know where it's gonna happen. So take very detailed notes that first year or two and make sure that you can apply some of these fungicides on a spot area. Um, you don't have to apply them willy-nilly everywhere, but it's very important. And in particular, where does the disease occur first? Where is that area on the golf course that might be a little bit too wet or just have that perfect environment where that disease is gonna happen first and then that's gonna be my clue that it can happen throughout the rest of the course or on, on other areas uh, that'll be like it. Um, know your efficacy, so this is, this is gonna be the hard part. Um, just because it's on the label doesn't mean that it's the best fungicide for the job. Um, you know, I can, I can hammer in the, a nail with the back end of a screwdriver, but a hammer is a lot more effective. Um, so it's, it's important that, and there's a number of university resources that you can use or local knowledge and, and try and, some of it might have to be trial and error. Um, so when I talk about site of act activity, um, there's two classes of fungicides. So one is a multi-site, and you can think of that as, as a general toxin or, or just general. It's, it's basically gonna impact that fungus in a number of different ways. Um, some of the new, most of the newer fungicides are gonna be single site of action though. Um, and what that means is that it's one part of the fungus of that metabolism and it's one part that that fungicide is impacting. Now it's, they're safer because for the most part we don't share that part. Um, and many of the environment, much of the environment doesn't share that part. Um, the problem is, is we get fungicide resistance much more quickly uh, when we use these single site of action. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, but these site specific, a lot of them are gonna be systemic fungicides, which means that they're gonna get inside the plant um, and you can have a longer, um, a longer amount of control with some of these. So we talked about where it, where it hits the fungus. Now this is what it does when it hits the plant. So there's contacts and most of these are gonna be our multi-sites, um, but they basically just act as a protectant. Um, so you can think of it as our, as our skin, um, acts as a protectant for microbes around us. Um, where, it, where it goes, it basically is just impacting, it's not letting the fungus get in, basically. Now penetrants are getting within the plant um, and most of these are gonna be acropetal and that's just a fancy word for saying they get into the xylem and they move up. And most of our fungicides do that. They will enter the plant and they will go up if they're systemics. There's only two, the, some of them are local so they'll go on one side of the leaf to the other side of the leaf um, but most of the fungicides that we have will move up in the plant. 
And then last but not least is what we call a systemic that moves up, truly systemic that moves up and down in the plant. Um, and there's only two of those, and they're uh, either the phosphites or phosphatyl aluminum. Um, so for the most part, we don't have a lot of those. Uh, when we look at our fungicide classes, I'm not going to read these off, but um, you know, for the most part, remember that our pythiums are in their own class over here, but then you have these other types of classes um, that will come with their own resistant risk. Um, so, um, now I looked a little bit, and I realize this, this data is a little bit dated, um, but I was able to find some information online about the top 10 imported fungicides. And I realized that most of your fungicides and most of your pesticides here in Thailand are not labeled specifically for turf grass. Most of them are probably coming in for rice, uh, to control rice blast, which is a very important pathogen in rice, and I know one of your major exports. Um, so when you look at these, the ones that we really um, share in the United States are, are most of them. Uh, Carbendazem and Perpinib, I don't know a whole lot about, um, but here's their, the trade names, at least, that we have in the United States, um, and then the chemical classes. Um, so all these that are highlighted, uh, we have in the United States. I will say that a lot of these are older chemistries, though. Um, Captan is not used very much in the United States anymore. Uh, we do use quite a bit of Mancozeb and, um, and some of these other ones, but for the most part, these are some older chemistries. Now, these are the common turf grass fungicides that we do use in the United States. Um, and the ones that I pointed out here are the ones that are similar from your top 10 imported fungicides on the other side. Um, so we do have, have a little bit of a disconnect um, on what we have. Now, I did see azoxystrobin and pyroclostrobin in the bin yesterday, so I should have had those, uh, those highlighted. Um, but for the most part, these are the, at least from your top 10 imported fungicides, they're much different than the turf grass fungicides that we use in the United States. So, the major thing when you're using fungicides and you're gonna make this investment and you're gonna spend the money is make sure that you know the disease that you're, you're trying to control. Um, so some of these fungicides, you'll look at particularly some of these systemics and you'll look at the label and you're like, wow, that's everything. I don't even need to think about this because I've got dollar spot, anthracnose, all these diseases. Um, so what's the big deal? Spray this and be done. Well, particularly if you're looking at these two, which you're not worried about, but this one, whenever you see take all patch, just transition your mind to Bermuda grass decline and we can get along. Um, but basically, these two are soil borne. So you need to be thinking about that. The other one is the one that you didn't see on there is Pythium blight or Pythium root rot. Um, and that's one that's going to take a completely different class of chemistry. Um, you're going to see this when you have wet, heavy rains. Uh, we have had pythium blight outbreaks on ultra dwarf Bermuda grass greens in the southeast. And it normally occurs when we have cloud cover. Our temperatures go down a little bit, so that might be why we don't see it. You don't see it here as much in, in Thailand and Southeast Asia. Uh, but you can have issues with that, and you also can have issues with pythium root rot, uh, particularly a soil borne disease. The problem is it's a whole different class of chemistry. Um, so now we've kind of that one fungicide that has everything on it doesn't have everything on it anymore. Um, the other aspect is, again, is it foliar or is it soil borne? So if you're targeting Bermuda grass decline or fairy ring, you're gonna need to put that fungicide where the pathogen is. Um, so you need to start looking, these are 3D glasses, but you need to start looking in 2D, or at least look down into the soil and where we're putting things. Um, so this is the most common mistake, and it's kind of like if you're trying to, to get to a mole and you're trying to use a baseball bat and you're standing up top, it's not going to work very well, is it, right? Because the mole is just going to go down into the tunnel. You need to get the baseball bat into the tunnel. Um, so in particular, again, this is Banner Max, but these two, Summer Patch and Take All Patch, are going to be soil borne, so you have to know where the pathogen is and you have to put the fungicide where that pathogen is. So when we think about this, um, you know, this is if you were to apply in four, four to eight liters per 100 meters squared, um, then basically you're only going to get to that foliage. 
If you're going to apply a little bit more, if you're going to go 8 to 12 liters, you might get down to the crown. But really, when we're talking about these soil-borne diseases, we're either applying in 20 liters per 100 meters square, that's a lot, or, which I think is better, is you're going to use post-application irrigation and put in, you're going to water in with uh, at least 3 millimeters of irrigation, preferably up to 5 millimeters of irrigation. Okay? So what you're trying to do is you're putting that fungicide down and then right after you're irrigating that fungicide down in. So when we're talking about post-application irrigation, it's important that we realize it's a lot of water. Um, I know this because I've done it on a research plot. Um, so when we look at this is uh, what our common measurement is when we talk one acre inch, and sorry, that's US, but that is one acre inch is 253,988 liters per hectare. When you get to 100 meters squared, it's 2,540 liters per 100 meters squared. That is 317 liters per 100 meters squared. And I know this because that's the size of my research plot. It's 14 liters per four and a half meters squared. That's a lot of water. And that is in that three millimeters of post-application irrigation is how much you're putting down. So pound it. If you're going after a soil-borne disease, you need to pound that fungicide in. Um, most of these fungicides also have what we call a high KOC value, so they tie up to organic matter very quickly um, and very strongly. So you need to get that water and get it down into the soil profile. It's also important that we know our fungicide chemistry and realize why we're doing that. So I talked about acropetal penetrance, um, which is what a lot of our fungicides are. This is a great resource. This is by um, Paul Vincelli and Bruce Clark. It's called Chemical Control of Turf Grass Diseases. It is free. All you have to do is type it into Google, and it will come up, and they update it every year. Um, it's one of my cheat sheets. I shouldn't tell you what my cheat sheets are, but it's one of my cheat sheets, and they update it every year. They do a fantastic job. But they have this one table, which I love, which basically takes everything, at least that we have in the States, uh, gives it our frac code and our fungicide group, but also talks about its mobility. And you see here, this is XMS. That stands for xylem mobile systemic. That means it's getting into the xylem and going up. So if that is occurring, and the only way that fungicide is going up, that means that however far down we put that fungicide, is as far down as it's going to go. It's not like the plant is taking it up and going, Oop, here you go, root, have that. It's not going to do that. So we have to make sure that when we're going after a soil-borne disease that we water that fungicide in. Um, it's also important, obviously, to know our, our area and what we're looking at. Um, this is, uh, some, will, some of you might recognize this. This is actually CM Country Club. Um, but this is the ACME planometer. Um, so if you're looking and, and need to know what the area is that you're controlling, um, this is very easy to use. It uses Google Maps, and you just outline it. Um, and it will give you, you can't read it down here, but it'll give you hectares and meters squared. Um, so there's really no excuse for not knowing how big the area is that you want to control. And particularly if you're looking at, OK, I know that I want to save a little bit of money so I only want to put this fungicide where I see this disease activity. You can outline that area and know exactly how big the, the area is and what rate you need to be uh, mixing your tank at. So now I want to get, uh, I'm, we're, go, we're going to dive in here. We're going to go in pretty deep. So there is a difference between the fungicides that you use here in Thailand and in Southeast Asia and the fungicides that we use in America. And I'm not sure that you're aware of how big this difference is. So this is um, Mancazeb. This is actually from, this is a Colombia, uh, the nation of Colombia label. Uh, but this is diethane. And basically I want to point out that our equivalent product in the, in the US is diethane as well. Uh, it's a 75% active. And this is our product rate. So the amount of active ingredients, and this is what's important. This is why I'm, I'm specifying active ingredients. 
you have to look at the active ingredient and not just um, what's going on with the uh, with, you know with the big fancy umbrella and everything on here. So the amount of active ingredient that we apply in the United States in grams per meter squared, this is the low rate and this is the high rate. Now I want to point out this is the rice label for diethane. And when we look at the U.S. Mancozeb, this is what our product rate is, and this is how that all kind of equivalates out. Um, and this is per 500 meters squared green, and that's about what I've put as the approximate. That's what it is for the rice label. So I want to point out what the differences are here. So you can see the product rate is much lower. There's actually more active ingredient there but the product rate is 0.4 grams per meter squared as opposed to 1.22 grams per meter squared. Look at the amount of active ingredient that you're putting down per that 500 meter squared green as compared to what we use on turf grass in the United States and our turf grass label. That is a large difference. Let's take it even a little bit farther. Things get more difficult when I look at your labels because your label says to mix in five milliliters of fungicide for 20 liters of spray solution. So now we've got to start thinking about, okay, how much water carrier am I going to put down on each, on the greens, okay? So again, if you're doing something foliar, you're looking at four to eight liters per 100 meters squared, um, but, and you might want to do that and just apply if you're going after soil borne, do that, and then put in post-application irrigation afterwards. That's probably what you, what you want to try and do. Um, but when we look at that product rate, and this is um, uh, headline, uh, which is pyroclostrobin and also azoxystrobin, they're at the same rate if you look at the rate on the bottle, which is that five milliliters of product per 20 li liters of water carrier. Let's say we have the water carrier that's four liters per um, hundred meters squared. We'll just use that as, as our rate. Uh, we're getting about one milliliter of product per hundred meters squared. Within that, if you look at the amount of grams active, and this is the key part on that fungicide label, the grams active per liter of solution, uh, per liter of that product, it's 0.25 grams of active per hundred meters squared at this four liters per 100 meter squared water carrier. Therefore, the active per 500 meter squared of green is 1.25 grams of active ingredient. And that's based off of what's on the label, on that little bottle that you have up there. Remember, this is targeting, I'm pretty sure it's targeting rice and rice blast. Let's look at what the American label is and a turf grass label. Do you see the difference? Active per 500 meters squared green is 15.2 grams of active versus the 1.25 grams of active that's on the bottle. You're not going to get very good control at going a thousand times less the rate than on turf grass. So they're not going with a spray hawk and going across. OK. So how do they know how much they're putting down, I guess, is that's, the point. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what I'm trying to get across. <laughs> OK. So I did this for a couple different ones. And, and you'll see this on your USB. Um, hopefully, I didn't get any of the calculations and the conversions wrong. Um, but for the most part, I just want to point out, if we look at this percent increased U.S. rate, 185, 80% more, 170% more, or twice as much, this is what I calculated for based off of the label and then try identifying. So there is a difference in our application method, and thanks for pointing that out. Um, for the most part, this is in a spray boom um, that's going across at a, at a, constant, um, at a constant rate.
Okay. So that's what I translated as what to be in Thailand. But what is this difference all about? Um, and basically, we, in turf grass, we use higher rates and higher frequency than production agriculture. Um, for the most part, when we're thinking about production agriculture, they are worried about an economic threshold. So they are worried about yield. We are worried about aesthetics. Those are two completely different things. The other aspect is, is that in a lot of production agriculture, they're looking at a annual plant. We need to have that there all the time. So our pathogen loads are going to come up with it all the time. You can harvest rice and then go to another crop. Um, so there are a number of different reasons. Um, we've got that higher demand. We're also continually injuring the plant every time we mow it. Um, so we're making our plant more susceptible. And then last and certainly not least, we do the most intense management of any other grower on the world because we grow plants that touch each other. And in fact, they're not even touching each other, they're interwoven. So a disease doesn't have to go from here to here to get a plant to a new plant, it has to go from here to here. So that is a, that is a huge difference between what we do as turf grass managers and production agriculture and farmers. So, and if you just look at this, particularly on a farm, you know, you've got plants that are pretty well spaced out. You know, if I'm a pathogen, this is, this is perfect. That's exactly what I want. Um, in particular, you know, if we want to spread a disease throughout a room, I would want all of you to be sitting up front and right next to each other, okay? But that's not what's going on here. I'd have to go from here to there to there to there and all the way in the back. So that's the same thing that's going on with turf grass, and that's why we have to use these higher rates to get satisfactory disease control. So make sure that you're doing uniform coverage, if you can use a spray hawk, um, and, and make sure that you're, you're trying to use the pr appropriate nozzle because every drop of these fungicides counts. Um, and in particular, if we're gonna need to use those higher rates um, that's off of not quite what that label is. Um, so now I want to finish up. I don't know how much time I have. I'm already at 12 o'clock. Um, I do want to show you a phrase mower, though, because I love phrase mower. Um, we're doing some research with this on a couple different diseases. Um, you guys have probably seen this before. Um, but with spring dead spot, we've got basically, I'll just go through real quick. What I want to point out is this is no phrase, four millimeters and eight millimeters, so a tickle and a woe. I want to point out that the more phrase mowing we do, the more reduction of spring dead spot we had, which is a soil borne disease. And we actually put the fungicide on right after we phrase mowed, and then we did it one more time in, in our fall. Um, and we saw, what I want to point out is that just the fungicide alone was the same as the phrase mowing treatment alone. So we're having an impact on that soil borne disease. We're also phrase mowing zoysia. So if you have old zoysia, um, particularly on a tee, where it almost feels like you're kind of sitting in there a little bit, uh, we phrase mow it at the, again, the tickle, the four millimeters, and got really good response. Uh, eight millimeters is too deep. Um, in fact, I still don't think we have zoysia grass there. Um, we did a little bit more work of trying to integrate blue, bluegrass with zoysia. That's me in an action pose, uh, telling him to stop the phrase mower. Um, and this is what it looked like right after we did it. And this is what it looked like two weeks later. Um, so you can phrase mow zoysia. Just don't go at eight millimeters, just a tickle. Um, and this is the bluegrass that we're getting into that zoysia grass. Um, now again, this is not for here, uh, but where in my transition zone, where we can't grow any grass well, um, we basically are gonna try and put two grasses together at the same time, see what happens. Um, and if you look back through history, some other people have tried this as well. So with that, um, I'll let you read the take home messages. I'm getting in the way of lunch and I apologize. Um, but remember, if you're using fungicides, you need to, to realize the rate, you need to know where the pathogen is. Um, try to use your cultural practices uh, to try and maintain turf health um, so that you can build a resistant plant. With that, I'll go ahead and 
and stop. This is my website, turfpath.missouri.edu. And that's me with a lovely Calvatia Gigantium. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Come along, you sexy thing. Okay, let's start.